I literally have a four day weekend. That's awful. You can go vote. <laughs> <laughs> well, voting, well, voting's on Tuesday. So that's, I already submitted my mail. Oh, nice. Yeah. So we're starting the um, last part of the class, which is um, high temperature geochemistry and cosmochemistry. So, like for the first, I don't know, this week and next week, especially, we're going to be talking about things that are probably what we would call cosmochemical. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the origin of the elements and some time scales for the development of the solar system and um, the universe. And then we'll talk about the kind of building blocks of the solar system and the building blocks of Earth. And then we'll spend a lot of time talking about differentiation of Earth, evolution of Earth, igneous processes, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of where we're headed over the next few weeks. So today we're kind of, kind of focused on things that happen in stars and a process called nucleosynthesis, which is the formation of our friend in the periodic chart. And as we'll learn, pretty much all the chemical elements that we see here on Earth and um, all the planets around us um, didn't come from our sun. Even though we all condensed from the same material, they weren't produced there. They were produced in an earlier stone. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. And then next time, we'll continue talking about um, how solar systems such as ours are thought to evolve um, from a gas, um, and including something called the condensation sequence, which is the process through which material goes from the gas phase to solids. And then we'll look at the sort of early buildup of small planetesimals. So that's, that's kind of this week. So this is kind of an overview of, um, okay, we somehow went from the Big Bang all mass and energy in a single point in space and time, which sort of rapidly expanded, did a bunch of stuff. We'll talk about estimates near the end of the day today of how old we think that is, different sort of approximations of that. But 15 billion years, giga annum or billion years. Um, and then the production of our solar nebula, right, which is a a, a proto-nebula, and we can see these things in space. These are clouds of gas with a hot interior that are on the way towards becoming a sun that will cool and condense and make planetesimals, which will grow and impact each other and have thermal metamorphism and resetting and um, eventually grow in size to make things that are more like planets and including sort of a proto-Earth, um, an Earth that keeps getting bigger, has a moon um, you know, sized collision event with an object called Theta, and then differentiates. And there's a lot of questions about how much differentiation was already um, happening by the time our moon formed. And we'll talk about all of these things, that chemical evidence for that specifically. And some of it will involve radioisotopes, which allow us to tell time. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit today, too, just to kind of remind you about radioactivity. And then as we move on, we'll talk about stuff like, okay, the growth of the continents, the development of an ocean, the development and evolution of an atmosphere, um, when did the first organisms evolve, and sort of getting to today's Earth. As I say, this is sort of will be the chemical constraints on that for the most part. So when we look at the kind of history of the early solar system, these are the kind of the four things that we think about as, oh, well, what, you know, what might be important? So one of them is just physical properties of matter and, you know, what phases are present, what conditions are they stable at, um, what are the kind of nuclear and electronic forces that bring things together and break things apart. Uh, chemical composition of stars, which is done through spectral analysis, chemical composition of samples of the moon and other planets, um, which can be done, you know, either through physical sampling, um, you know, and or uh, meteorite material that falls to Earth that's been associated with these various bodies, or spectral analysis. And then, you know, there's some other aspects of physical properties that help us understand things like um, rates of expansion and, and early conditions. So um, 
you know, there's, there are variations on a theme here that we're not going to probably get into the details of, but I think this, and, and some of these things are hard to um, kind of visualize and theorize, especially because some of the conditions under which things happen are conditions that we can't reproduce on Earth, like the formation of elements and suns. Um, we haven't even really gotten to the point where we can mimic what our sun does, which is fuse hydrogen into helium in any sort of effective amount. That's how it burns its energy. And we'll learn how that releases energy today. But that requires intense heat and intense pressure. I will tell you that stars like our sun can do that, but they can't do anything else on the periodic chart. They can't make any of these other elements. Those require more intense conditions of heat and pressure or high fluxes of neutrons, such as occurred during supernovae. And so um, this is what, where the chemical elements are made. We have the theory for it, and we understand, again, by spectral analysis of stars and comparing different stars with different sort of sizes and shapes and luminosities and densities, gravita which are inferred from their gravitational fields and so forth, kind of you know, how this process happens. But as we'll see as we get into it today, there are also some speculation, especially about the time scale, the frequency, um, of events, but the bottom line is that in a galaxy such as ours, we're constantly building up nebula, having them condensed, making stars. Some of those stars go through a variety of different processes, but they make elements, then they die, and they disperse that material back into the, you know, interstellar gas. And there's kind of a, with that, for lack of a better understanding, we assume that this happens in a kind of a steady state process. It's kind of always enriching the interstellar space around solar systems such as ours, so that when our solar system formed, it locked in the conditions that existed when it formed, which would have been about five, five billion years ago, somewhere in between five billion years ago and 4.56 billion years when the Earth formed. We'll, we'll talk later about how we narrow down that uh, sort of half a billion year um, time gap. But this is process is called nucleus synthesis, the making of chemicals. This is a chart of um, the nuclides, as it's called. So it's got the number of neutrons across the bottom, right? Which only affects the mass of a nucleus. It has no bearing on its chemistry per se, at least as we understand it from the balanced electron perspective. But this is the proton number, which is the thing that defines, you know, what chemical element is. That's the one-to-one -one line. And so what you can see very obviously is that these uh, solid areas are all of the existing nuclei on Earth, and um, they start to deviate. So you get heavier and heavier, there's more and more neutrons that sort of offset the protons, and we'll talk a little bit about the processes through which this is formed today, um, but in essence, it involves cramming neutrons into things to build up the periodic chart from smaller, um, subatomic particles. There's a couple of other kind of interesting things if you just add stuff up in here. You look at the atomic number, right? Um, we can have two choices. The atomic number can be even or odd, meaning, you know, um, the sum of the, uh, I should say it's atomic mass, the sum of the um, protons and neutrons. And those can come from four different um, combinations, right? And even um, atomic mass can come from an even number of protons and neutrons, which are the most abundant types of elements that we have. And um, you can see this odd-odd combination, even though it results in even, it's really unpopular. Uh, we have very few of those. And in the case of sort of odd atomic masses, we have this kind of roughly equal mix of where one of the two numbers is odd and one of the two numbers is even. And this actually helps nuclear physicists understand something about the conditions under which these um, stable nuclei were produced, which we'll get to. So before that, I just kind of want to remind you of um, some of the main forms of radioactive decay because they're really important in this story. So um, one kind of the, uh, radioactive decay is called beta decay. It's a very common type of decay. It's the emission of a small particle that can either be positively or negatively charged. This negatively charged is basically an electron. It has a slightly different energy than the electron that's you know, orbiting around an atom. But when um, an element em emits um, a beta minus particle, 
it's going to change the atomic, the Z, right? The proton number, but it's not going to change the mass, right? So basically what happens when we emit an electron is a neutron spits out an electron and becomes a proton. That's what a beta minus decay is. Another kind of decay is a beta plus, which is something called a positron. It's basically the same thing. You take a proton and you um, spit out a positron and turn it into a neutron. So again, it's not going to change the mass of the chemical, but it's going to change what the chemical is. Then we have another process called K capture, which is when an inner shell electron gets absorbed by a nucleus. It's a lot less uh, common than this. But in essence, if you take a, an electron and you suck it into a nucleus, you're going to make a proton into a neutron, right? And so you're going to have the same condition as what happens in a beta plus, right? And there's energy exchanges with this. And then there's these other types of radioactive decay which involve much more massive particles, right? In all three of these cases, the mass of these particles like the mass of an electron. But over here, if you emit an alpha particle, this is a helium nucleus, a helium so um, it's got a total mass of four, two protons, two neutrons. This is how, for instance, uranium and thorium primarily decay. Okay, and so you're taking a much bigger particle and you're spitting it out. And we can actually track this on Earth. This has been building up in, in, in the interior of the Earth and the mantle over Earth history. And so when this kind of decay happens, not only do we change the number of protons because we're spitting two of them out here, but we also change the number of neutrons so we change both the mass and the atomic number, right? So when you look at a radioactive decay, you can usually kind of tell, um, did the mass stay the same and only what the element is change, which is Z, or did A and Z um, change? And most likely, this is what you will be looking at if A and Z change. Now, there's another kind of radioactive decay, which we'll talk about, which is called fission, which is when nuclei split um, into two smaller fragments. I mean, in all these cases, that's what's happening, but two fragments of substantial mass. And as we'll see when this happens, it's usually not a split in half. It's a statistical process where we get a family of chemical elements, um, some of them at about two-fifths of the original mass, and some of them at three-fifths of the original mass. Like I say, we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail uh, coming up. Okay, so... That's the radioactive decay equation. I'm assuming everyone's seen it before, right? The change in the number of atoms with respect to time of a radioactive material is proportional to the number of atoms that are present times the decay constant. The decay constant, lambda, you can derive this for yourself by um, taking that equation and substituting in a time zero and a time one at which we have half as much of that element present because of radioactive decay, okay? And that gives us what's called the half-life. And the half-life is just the natural log of two over lambda. So you can always go back and forth between lambda, decay constants, and half-lives. In the kind of popular um, press, science fiction, whatever, people always talk about half-lives, and they're important, but normally when we're making these calculations, we're really using lambda. Okay, and they're just inverse of each other. So something with a really long half-life, like uranium-238, which is, uh, has half-life roughly the same as the age of the Earth, is going to have a really low lambda. Something with a really high lambda is going to have a short half-life. Right, so a high lambda basically means a high rate of decay for the same number of atoms present, some pile of materials. If lambda is really high, we get a big number of atoms changing per unit time. That's what you can measure with a Geiger counter. So high lambda is very radioactive, low lambda, not so radioactive, okay? <clears throat> now, another thing we can measure is something called the activity. That's what's actually measured on, for instance, a, uh, a Geiger counter something. The activity of a chemical element is this lambda times the number of elements present. Right, so as you can imagine, if you have a material with a certain radioactivity, some fraction of that is going to be decaying um, as predicted by the lambda. But the number of decays that we will detect depends on how much material we have, right? If you have like a tiny little pile of uranium and a big pile of uranium, we're going to measure more radioactivity from the big pile of uranium because there's more of it present. <clears throat> but the amount is you know, always proportional to, to the lambda. So when we start to talk about stuff like heat production in the interior of the earth and that kind of stuff, which liberates 
um, energy because of radioactivity, it's going to matter how much we have of something. How much we have is going to make, tell us how many decays we're getting per unit time, which is what activity is. <clears throat> okay, so um, when we make the chemical elements, wherever they're made, and I'll tell you they're made predominantly in stars, um, there's some stuff that, that we like to think about, such as just with the physics of it, what are the conditions that allow some chemical elements to form and not form? What are the stability requirements? What is the kind of quantum mechanical predictions? What is the density, the pressure, the temperature of the medium where it should form? Uh, how do we result in the population distribution of odd, even isotopes that we have? All that kind of stuff. Um, and when we add up all that stuff, we, we figure we you know, understand that this pretty much only happens in the cores of stars for the most part. Um, and our star is definitely not massive enough to do this, right? And we can observe from our star. And in fact, we can compare, and we'll look at this in coming weeks, the composition of our star, the composition of some of the least differentiated materials in our solar system, and they have very similar compositions. We feel like they came from the same material that hasn't really evolved since then by the production of new chemicals. With the exception of hydrogen being fused together to burn to make helium and a, a much lesser amount um, of lithium and a couple of other kind of exotic isotopes. So we have to look beyond the birth of our solar system to find where chemical elements are formed. And we can look all around us within our galaxy, within other galaxies, and understand this process. And so um, it's useful to kind of review how this all works, right? So the theory of the Big Bang, right, which you know, people have proposed various modifications thereof, but it's still the kind of underlying thing that we feel like best explains the distribution of matter and energy in the known visible universe today, which is that um, out of essentially nothing uh, or a condition that we don't really understand, the very first matter appeared at a singular point and it started expanding out from that, right? The very first matter was made out of quarks and the quarks probably condensed into neutrons in like 10 microseconds, a really, really short period of time, right? a microsecond being a millionth of a second. And after that happened, things evolved pretty quickly. So this is, you can find these kind of, you know, I just got this off of Google images. This is, um, you know, a kind of a, a fun plot in one sense because it's got these different um, temperatures and different time frames. And the time frames are not arranged in any kind of like it's not, not exactly logarithmic, but here you got 10 to the minus 43 seconds, 10 to the minus 34 seconds, 10 to the minus 10, one second, three minutes, 300,000 years, 1,000 million years, which is like the British way of saying a billion years, and 15,000 million years, which is 15 billion years, 15 giga annum. And so this is a second right here in the middle of that. And so, you know, in essence, by about a second, we're at the place where we're starting to have some of the material that we recognize as the building block of matter, right? The subatomic particles. And it takes quite a bit of time before that to start to even make atoms, right? And then after we make atoms and we start to condense the material, it, over a, um, a, a pretty extensive period of time, we then condense and gravitationally collapse the material enough to the point where it can start the nuclear um, fission process, such as what drives our sun, where we start to have luminous bodies in the sky. Some of those stars are very massive, and they go through a various sequence of events that produce the chemical elements. Those stars, some of them have very short lifetimes, measured in millions of years. Some of them have very long lifetimes, measured in billions of years. It's kind of a question of how big and how hot are they? And we understand that stars end up with sort of one of two conditions. One is they explode in the supernova, and the other is, is that they condense in on themselves when their nuclear fuel buys, burns out, and they become either a dwarf or, or a neutron star or something like that. So in essence, stars are basically held out. They're very dense regions of space, but they're, the energy that they produce allows them to have luminosity and to not collapse in on themselves. And around that, you know, planets, planetesimals that then collide and differentiate up into planets and support life happen. And so it's a pretty incredible thing when you think about the number of steps 
that went on for us to be able to have the solar system that we have. So these are some of these other you know, time considerations. People think that it took about 12 minutes to be able to have equal numbers of protons, neutrons, and electrons, right? So after the quarks form, they can to make the neutrons and the neutrons, some of them spontaneously decay to make a proton plus an electron. The mass and the charge are still balanced. There's a different distribution of energy. And it's useful to remember that a hydrogen atom, right, is one proton and one electron and no neutrons. And a deuterium atom, you know, we have a two here, as we talked about um, last or I guess last week or the week before, I can't remember, you know, where there's a proton and a neutron and an electron, right? And so um, all the other atomic matter that we have ultimately come from hydrogen nuclei in one way or another, okay? Um, some of it, you know, involves taking neutrons and adding them to things that are the products of hydrogen building up into other things, um, which in a way is not directly a hydrogen nuclei, but in essence, I would say most material or all material comes from hydrogen. And the next thing that we form are some heavier elements, right? So adding in a neutron into, the, into a hydrogen one makes a deuterium, adding in another one makes tritium. We talked about tritium in a short half-life, and we can make the two isotopes of helium. Okay, and the proportions of them tell us sort of, you know, the conditions that we think existed. And it's sort of estimated it took like a day or so to get to a place where about 24% of the mass that was present when this singularity after it had formed and started to expand out, it was still very, very dense, very hot. Um, you know, it was something like a quarter of helium and the rest of it's hydrogen, right? And it's just kind of expanding out, populating all of the space of the um, of the universe. So then it took about 300,000 years, this is another estimate, a theoretical physical estimate, to have electrically neutral atoms, meaning the hydrogen, the helium of these various planets had electrons around them. Before that, it was a plasma. Plasmas are conditions where the electrons are not directly associated with the, um, the nuclei that they kind of come with. They're just sort of floating around in a suit. Okay, so then take that material, disperse it out, do it in such a way that um, it doesn't happen completely homogeneously. And there's, there's various theories about this, but you start to get sort of waves of material where we have um, areas that have higher density of the various nuclei that we just talked about in areas that have lower density. So that allows there to be slightly different variations in gravitational attraction. Places that ended up with slightly more material, that material attracts to itself and it reinforces so that we get areas with enough of these nuclei that they can start to collapse gravitationally. And during that process, the temperatures increase, the pressures increase, and we can start what we call nuclear burning, which is a fusion process. And this is sort of how chemical elements are made. So we're going to talk a little bit about the energetics about that. For instance, if you take two hydrogen atoms and two neutrons, cram them together with high temperature and high pressure, you will make a helium nucleus and you'll liberate some energy. That's the energy that we feel coming off our sun as light. It only happens at really extreme conditions, but it happens. Okay, we also make some, um, you know, of these isotopes, we make some helium-3, but this is the main thing that we make, okay? And um, this reaction actually involves multiple steps. It isn't just a single, you know, make it happen, but, um, and we'll get to that in a second. This is just another kind of illustration of the kind of time scale and processes to summarize that we're going to talk about next, um, which is, sort of time is moving along this axis. We start out with the Big Bang. We make these elements that we just talked about. Um, this, the amount of lithium we make is very, very small. We do make some, but not very much. And by this point in time, you know, we've kind of evolved from uh, primordial gas into having these kind of proto stars, early stars. Early stars were really big, burned really fast, and then died. And then they disperse their material. Then new stars formed in their place and, and multiple evolutions of them. So that um, while we don't have much evidence and of the sort of very, very earliest, sort of what we are called population one and two stars, there are plenty of population three stars, sort of next gen, if you want, stars out there that can be observed. 
And some of these stars, as I say, they go through this process of they're really big, they're really energetic, they're cranking along, and then they supernova. And during the supernova process is when we get this really high neutron flux. And that really high neutron flux is what allows us to build up the majority of the periodic chart heavier than the other iron. Okay? We call that the R process. There's another related process, and we'll talk about what that is in a second, called the S process, which is another process of stuffing neutrons into nuclei and building up the periodic chart. As, as the S and the R imply, it's basically what is the flux of neutrons per unit time, and how does that compare with the ultimate radioactivity of all these nuclei that we're making? Because when we start to crank a bunch of neutrons into material, we make unstable nuclei. And if we can crank the neutrons in faster than the unstable nuclei can decay, then they can produce something different than if the neutron flux is slower than a rate of decay. Either case, we're going to keep adding neutrons, and every nucleus has something called a neutron capture cross-section, which tells us its propensity to accept the neutron or not. Not all of us are the same in that regard. But depending on this trade-off between taking in neutrons and decaying to something else, and continue to do that in stepwise fashion until the neutron flux goes down. And then when the neutron flux goes down, whatever is left just decays until it's no longer radioactive. That's how we populate the, the heavy part of the current chart. <clears throat> so then um, there's <clears throat> you know, some of these stars that build up um, their mass so that they can do nuclear fusion, but don't build up as quickly they won't go through this process. They'll go through a slightly different process called nuclear burning, which is a fusion process of cramming helium nuclei together until we build up the periodic chart up to about um, the element iron. So that's where we make the carbon and the oxygen and the silicon and that kind of stuff. And we'll find and we'll look at the distribution of the elements in their atomic masses, and we'll see that the most favorable or the most abundant are things that have um, intervals of four in their mass with carbon 12, right? Oxygen 16, silicon 32, iron 56. These are elements that are favored because they um, are intervals of four. And this is from the, the um, combining together and of, of helium nucleus. And you can see here the kinds of elements that are formed in these two different processes, the R and the S process, as I say, we'll talk about them a little bit more. We can observe this happening today. We can observe stars with these conditions and um, that, are, that we um, can see high proportions of one or another process going on. We know that all of the things that can happen to make elements, that must have happened to make the elements in our sun, couldn't happen, not only couldn't have happened in our star, but they couldn't happen in one other star. Right, you can make some elements one way, some elements another way, um, but you can't make them all at one time. We'll also talk about evidence for what we call extinct radionuclides, things that were produced, were radioactive, and then decayed into something else, and and that gives us the abundance of the stable isotopes we have today. And in some materials, we have short enough live extinct radionuclides that, that when they were alive, they went over a very short period of time, we'll find them distributed differently in different materials. Like think about, um, you know, you go from a planetary gas, you condense it, you somehow separate into an iron rich phase, which can become, you know, like a metallic core and a silicate rich phase. And if we find a different amount of the extinct radionuclide in those two things, it tells us that those two things separated while that thing wasn't extinct, while it was still decaying, which gives us a time scale over which that happened. Okay, and as I say, well, we're, we will discuss these time scales in great detail. Not today. Um, we'll probably won't get to them until next week, but they tell us a lot about how long we think this process happens. Okay, so the first thing to think about are stars like ours, the puny ones that only burn hydrogen. Okay, and they sit on something called a main sequence. This is a Hertzsprung Russell diagram. This is a surface temperature, and this is the kind of multiples of solar luminosity, meaning one is like our sun, um, 10 to the minus one is 10 times less, 10 times as much, 100 times as much, et cetera. Okay? And what we find is, is that if you bring together enough material from a solar nebula 
that is massive enough to burn hydrogen into helium, how long it lives and how bright it burns is directly a function of mass, right? And so these are our time scales that of which they will last, right? So you know, it's estimated that our sun <clears throat> has something like nine billion years of juice in it. We're like half done. <clears throat> okay. Something that's much more massive, like something that's a thousand times as massive, it's only got like 67 million years of time in it. And this has been worked out by looking at other, you know, stars in the solar system, or excuse me, stars in the solar system, stars in, in our galaxy and in other galaxies. And so um, this is kind of the inverse correlation of size and rate at which they burn. But they ultimately kind of do the same thing. Now, some of these stars that are massive enough, not like our sun, but stars that are much more massive, like a thousand times more massive, after they're done with this process, they can exit off of this process and start doing other nuclear burning, the burning that makes the carbon and the oxygen. We'll talk about that process. Um, and other stars like ours are really small. They follow a different trajectory, what's called the, the oftentimes the, the red dwarf trajectory. Once they're done with their hydrogen, there isn't enough mass to condense to gravitationally attract in on itself and um, continue burning. So they, they usually end up being, you know, a kind of mildly luminous body in the sky. Now, this is basically another depiction of that same mean sequence, but um, showing you there's something that that sort of area off to the side is called the um, AGB or um, asymptotic giant branch. It's basically just a region of this diagram that produces many, uh, the, where the stars produce many of the chemical elements that we think of as, you know, the important hydrogen or helium burning uh, elements. Okay, so there's one other thing to talk about before we get on to that process, which is understanding the relative emission of energy that comes from fusion and under what conditions it happens and what conditions it doesn't happen. And these are things you can calculate for yourself. So that, for instance, I've given you some uh, rest masses of a helium nucleus, a helium four nucleus, the mass of a neutron and a proton, and the speed of light, and we can use the E equals delta mc squared uh, relationship to calculate what's called a mass defect, right? So if we just take the mass of a helium, right, which is over here, and we subtract from it the mass of two protons and two neutrons, we'll see that there's a small mass here, right? It's different. When protons and neutrons come together they uh, <clears throat> to make a helium nucleus, it's a little bit less mass present in that helium nucleus than there was in the individual particles. And we could take the amount of mass, that so-called mass defect, and convert it into energy and figure out you know, how much energy is formed in that process. And it seems like a, a really, really small number, but if you do this you know, billions and billions of times, it becomes a big number. And this energy from the mass defect is, the, is what we see as light coming from the sun and all the other energy that comes out of our sun from this process. Pick, putting together these nucleons to make this nucleus gives us energy. And this process is the same process that builds up most of the periodic chart from hydrogen to iron. As we fuse stuff together, it liberates energy. And this is sort of the, you know, the goal of being able to do nuclear fusion on Earth to liberate energy, you know, but can, making the conditions of pressure and temperature where this happens are pretty difficult because as you can imagine, you need to really squeeze on stuff and make it very hot to make this process happen because otherwise these particles are coulombically um, repelling each other. Okay, so um, if you just make a comparison of like the amount of energy there and you say, okay, well, let's just look at an apple average, you know, mass of 200 grams, you eat it, you digest it, you get 50 kilocalories of energy out of it. You can compare the amount of energy that's released when you eat and metabolize uh, an apple, assuming that you, you know, completely metabolize it, and you can see that it is the equivalent, right, of burning by fusion this really small amount. You know, this is less than one millionth of a gram. This is um, 0.1 millionth of a gram of hydrogen gas, right? So 200 grams of apple 
that you um, break the chemical bonds in and digest liberates the same amount of energy as the nuclear fusion of 0.1 million grams of atoms of hydrogen. Right? So, you know, gram per gram, that's something like a billion times more energy that's released when we do the nuclear fusion. The, the potential is a ton. So, um, <clears throat> Once we get above uh, helium-4, which is really straightforward to make like an R sun, um, then you have, to, you have to jump a gap to make the heavier nuclei. Like we don't have in our star, and we've not identified it anywhere else, something with an atomic mass of five, right? It just doesn't exist. So atomic mass of six exists, seven, eight, nine, 10. It's just five doesn't exist. So somehow, um, you need that, you know, the process through which things are brought together um, to build up the heavier nuclei have to work in a way that they don't produce that, but they produce the heavier stuff. And to get to burning beyond beyond hydrogen burning, which is what the process we were just talking about, requires something called helium burning, which is sticking two helium together, or a helium and a hydrogen, or you know, any intervals thereof. To build up the rest of the chart, and that takes something that's more massive than our sun, right? What this exact number here is not, you know, super precise, but something that's at least one and a half or twice as, as big as our sun, and um, that allows the core to get denser and hotter than our sun does, um, and produce the heavier elements. And the heavier the element, the more uh, sort of intensity we need in the nuclear fusion, the higher the pressure or the higher the temperature. So here's, for instance, a helium burning reaction where we stick two helium together and we make a beryllium nucleus. Okay. And so, and that has it, one of these, um, you know, intervals of four. So it's pretty common. Then, you know, we take a helium and we add it to a beryllium and we make a carbon 12. Each one of these processes liberates energy. Okay, by that E equals MC squared uh, relationship that we talked about, you can calculate how much energy, right? And it takes energy, it takes energy to make it happen, to push these things together. But when it does happen, it liberates more energy than it takes. And that's what fuels those kinds of stars, okay? So interestingly enough, this, for instance, beryllium-8, if we know it, it forms, but um, we don't have it here on Earth. We can identify it in the spectra of stars, but because it's really radioactive, right? It's got a half-life of 10 to the minus 16 seconds. As soon as it, it gets formed, it decays again. But imagine you're in a condition where you're making this stuff, it's decaying really quickly, but you've got high enough density that, you, that sometimes you're able to crank one of these into one of these before it decays and you can make a carbon-12, which isn't radioactive. So all that carbon-12 that we have, as we understand it, was formed by this process, meaning the density of, of helium nuclei in that, uh, you know, sort of plasma was high enough that we're able to do this pretty often, even though the beryllium has a really strong half-life, if that makes sense. This just kind of illustrates the intensity of these processes. They're happening really fast, and they're happening in a very high-density medium, okay? So then, um, there are, if we look at the abundance of the elements, we'll look at this in a moment, there's kind of only small amounts of elements with you know, Z, 3, 4, or 5. Um, and then when we get to, to 6, we start to see a little bit more, 6 being carbon. Okay, so this is kind of the sequence of what happens in stars as a function of their mass and their luminosity that we just talked about and surface temperature. And just always remember that the bigger the star and the more stuff it burns, the shorter it lives, right? So for instance, if we have a big star that, that's doing carbon burning or whatever, we don't really expect it to have a planetary system on which life could evolve and all that kind of stuff because it's really short lived. But so in a star like ours, where we've got only hydrogen burning, the majority of that star is just, you know, a, whatever, a gas of hydrogen with a core where hydrogen is being pushed together to make it. And it's only happening in the center of our sun and or, or other small stars like this. 
And when this is done, this is just going to collapse in on itself, but it's not going to progress higher. But more massive stars, right? They're big enough that they're a big blob. They've got some unburned um, hydrogen in the annulus, but, but relatively far out from the um, you know, uh, center, they can be doing hydrogen burning. That's what this little annulus is reflecting. And in the center, they can be do helium burning, the stuff that we just talked about. Or helium can be put together to make beryllium and then to make carbon, right? And so those stars are much more massive, right? They also have an event when, they, when they're done, they're done. But if, um, if the star is big enough, massive enough, dense enough, high enough temperature, there's a bunch of other reactions that happen in sequence that can build up the chemical elements all the way to iron. So as these names imply, when we say helium burning, we're fusing helium together to make heavier nuclei. When we're doing carbon burning or neon burning or oxygen burning or silicon burning, silicon burning is putting two silicons together and making something else, right? It requires really high density. I've just shown you, for instance, this is what carbon burning looks like, right? So we take some carbon, we add some helium to it, and we make some oxygen 16. Okay, so this down here basically tells you the fuel, the product, and the temperature that's required, right? So you can see here, we've got like 3 billion degrees Kelvin to make the elements near iron, which come from a combination of magnesium and sulfur burning. So this is from your text. This is sort of a summary of the time scale. Excuse me, the, um, the time scales are on the plot. The temperature and the density at the core of the, of the sun and how long these processes take. And so for a star to go all the way through to do this, right? You can, you can add up these time scales to get its lifetime, but it might spend 7 million years just burning hydrogen. And then it gets to the point where it can start to burn some helium in its core, and then some carbon, and some neon, and some silicon, right? These aren't lasting very long. Once you see a star doing that, they're pretty much on their way to being done. And their ultimate fate is often explosion in a supernova. supernova. Okay. So the more massive the star, the more quickly it evolves. And so this is part of the way that we understand, presumably in the earliest the universe, as material was still expanding out from the singularity, things were a lot more dense. It was easier to assemble the building blocks of much more massive stars that were burning and doing their thing and then dying in these sort of short time scales, you know, 10 million years or less, and then exploding and dispersing their material back out into space and then forming again, right? So that now we think about, oh man, our star, you know, it's so old and, you know, that process doesn't happen very often. But our, you know, by the time our star condensed from, you know, the uh, material around it, there was already 10 million years of history of the universe before then, during which point lots of these other kinds of stars had formed and died and formed and died, producing the sort of population of chemical elements that we see here. So this is a diagram showing you how much energy do I liberate when I crank together various protons and neutrons from the rest masses using that e equals mc squared equation for the entire periodic chart. So this is the mass number, and this is the binding energy is what it's called. The energy stored within a nucleus relative to the rest mass of the particles. And what you see here is that the diagram is divided in half. It's got a peak, that's the element iron, that's the atomic mass of iron that when we're lighter than iron, as we march up in mass, we liberate energy, okay? And when we get heavier than iron, as we march up in mass, it takes energy to go to those places. There's less energy stored in those, in, um, in those things. So we have to put in energy. And there's a, there's a curve fit to this, which isn't super important, but it's shown here. But the key thing to note by this is that the way we know that we only build up to about iron through the nuclear burning process is that to go beyond iron, we have to put energy into it, right? And that's just not, not going to happen thermodynamically uh, very often. Whereas when we're lighter than iron, we're liberating energy, right? So these elements, heavier than iron, have to be made a different way. These are the neutron flux elements. 
the elements that are made by taking the products of the supermassive stars that are making the nuclear burning processes or elements, and then exposing them to a bunch of neutrons and building up the heavier part of the periodic chart. So the vast majority of the periodic chart, it does, you know, everything heavier than iron. So all these rows down here and stuff, that's made by taking the stuff that happened in these stars and then was dispersed into uh, interstellar space and bringing them back together. And so at one point in time, either when that first star died or when the material brought back, you know, exposing them to a bunch of neutrons, a bunch of neutrons. And that bunch of neutrons, for instance, only happens either uh, in supermassive stars kind of right before they supernova or during supernova. Those are the places where we get the neutron flux high enough to be able to make the bulk of the periodic chart. So these are just a couple of other diagrams um, <clears throat> that show you some of the things that help us understand the statistics of this process and energetics. So this is the nuclear burning, right? And this is only up to mass of magnesium, but um, what you can see here is the relative proportion of elements with different masses, right? And so this is where you can see there's helium-4, carbon-12, oxygen-16, neon-20, all the things with intervals of four are poking up, right? But as we go up in atomic mass, the amount that it pokes up, the anomaly becomes less and less, right? So um, this helps a, a, us understand the relative abundance of the elements, like why we have so much more carbon-12 than carbon-13, for instance. Okay? There are other processes that go on that make um, you know, carbon-13, whether it's made by neutron addition on carbon-12 or some other series of processes, they're much less likely than the nuclear burning. They're not, they don't have not happen because we have that element, but they happen a lot less. <clears throat> and this is basically just another, you know, uh, diagram showing you the kind of nuclear binding energy, but now divided up, um, you get to see um, each of the various isotopes instead of just the atomic masses. And so you can also see that they're, they're scattered. And I don't know if you can see, but there's things that are above and below this line. That's for the odd and even nuclei. And that's how we get that, that proportion of those things. So this is another diagram from um, uh, some of the reading that's in uh, that's up there on La Lima, the broker diagram. And it basically shows you, now we're not talking about energy, we're talking about the relative abundance, okay? The relative abundance of different isotopes. And again, you can see all these mass or isotopes poking up. Those are the um, helium burning elements that are formed in stars that are much more uh, much larger than ours. He calls this nuclear cooking, right? But it's just a nuclear burning uh, fusion process. And then everything from iron up, right, is what's called the, are the neutron capture elements. And these are the things that come from that neutron um, flux that we talked about. And here's the sort of odd, even differences. So, you know, some of the things that you can highlight along here, um, you know, we'll talk about next. But um, you can also see that there's kind of a gap in abundances when we go in between sort of calcium and iron, which again gives us an idea about the relative frequency at which some of these processes happen that make the elements in between the supermassive ones and uh, or massive for the uh, nuclear cooking perspective. And some of these one uh, nuclei that are a little bit less massive, they just have energetically less favorable pathways. A few more plots just kind of showing you, for instance, some of the chemical elements um, and pointing out two other things, right? Which are that as we go up into the heavier and heavier, so I guess one thing I should point out is that this plot doesn't go all the way up, right? This is chopped off. Yeah, question. Um, <clears throat> so nuclear cooking is S frost? No, ne neither. Uh, S and R process, which we'll talk about in a second, are neutron capture. Nuclear cooking is the building of um, most of the chemical elements by adding helium nuclei into other things. That's the alpha particle uh, capture process that, for instance, three of them come together to make a carbon-12, four of them come together to make an oxygen-16, et cetera, et cetera. That's what nuclear cooking is. Fusion. So that's the AGB stars, right? Uh, yes, that's it does happen in AGB stars. Yeah. Although this happens there too. 
Oh, okay. Oh, so oh, okay. It, you get more than one thing happening in a star. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, but you don't get this happening in our sun, for instance, because it's not massive enough, right? So it takes a, a certain mass, some only some small fraction of stars getting less and less as the universe ages and expands and the density of material that can come together to make an individual star keeps going down on average. It's harder and harder, but if you think back early in time, we had more stars that were more massive that could do more of this kind of stuff. Yeah. So, um, so as I say, this, this diagram doesn't go all the way out. It only it chops off. Um, this diagram goes all the way out. Okay. There's a couple of things you can see on this diagram. You can see the odd even stuff. Of this heavy, we're going to see lead sticks up. We'll talk about that. Lead sticking up is primarily because thorium and uranium decay to make lead, and so we've got an extra of it because of that. But there's a couple of other things that um, that we sort of notice when we look at the abundances of the elements, which is that there's a couple of peaks up here at really high numbers, relative peaks, higher numbers of those nuclei, with um, a neutron number of 82 and of 126, okay? And this, these are what are called magic numbers. They have, there's something with the symmetry of the nucleus when it has those number of neutrons, and there could be a variety of different proton numbers associated with it. You don't necessarily have to have just one chemical element. And in the R process, which is a more rapid flux of neutrons than the S process, we end up with chemical elements that are produced from them that are slightly different in mass, right? They both have this number of neutrons, no matter that, but they have slightly different number of protons, which gives us different chemical elements and result in these kind of bumps. And uh, to, to be honest, I myself don't really understand what about the physics of these things causes them to be a little bit more abundant, but what they are is like a little bit less radioactive during this process of neutron flux. And so we end up producing more of them in the process. So just useful things to remember. And if you look at the kind of relative abundances here, and oftentimes the relative abundances are looked at as the number of any given atom relative to the number of hydrogens. That's what, that's what people do when they look at a um, spectrum from a star. That's not so useful when we then start to look at when stuff cools and condenses and you start to make planets like ours, instead we like to look at the relative abundance relative to the silicon, right? And so sometimes you'll see these stellar abundances being ratioed to silicon, you know, which can be observed and, and you can make that ratio. Sometimes it's relative to hydrogen. You just have to look at, you know, what it says in the caption to be able to be sure wh which one you're looking at. Um, but the proportion of these things, and so you can see here, these are log scale, Here's hydrogen way up here, and all these other things are left. But you can see, you can start to understand, well, why are the, you know, the elements that are so common on our planet, silicon, iron, oxygen, carbon, why are they so common on our planet? Magnesium, because they're common here, right? There, it's not just that there's sort of something about the materials, the minerals and stuff that make up our planet that are why we have these things. It's that there was just a lot of that in the original suit and, um, and a lot less of these other things in the original suit. And then of course, there's you know some of the processes through which matter is assembled and differentiated and produced to make planets affects the ultimate distribution, but we haven't gotten to that place yet. We're not just looking at the distribution within stars, the sort of starting materials from which planets will form. <clears throat> okay, so now let's talk about neutron addition, the R and S process. Okay. This happens in two different phenomena that we understand. I mean, it's probably multiple others as well, but the two primary things are the R process, which happens when a star explodes at the end of its life in a supernova, right? And that, as it implies, it's a very, very rapid, high-intensity flux in neutrons and something called the S process. The S process is a slower flux of neutrons, but it's still a lot of neutrons. And this is thought to happen in the exterior regions of a supermassive star before it dies, before it's supernovas, but it's got enough neutrons spitting out of it that it can undergo that process. <clears throat> and then we have these two pathways, okay? On a plot that looks like the atomic abundance plot, so again, we've got the neutrons and the protons, okay? And remember, there's like a one-to-one -one line in low masses, 
that defines the stable nuclei, and then um, it starts to punch over. And part of the reason that it, it you know punches over has to do with you know what the starting material is. Doing. So there's radioactivity going on all the time, and there's also the super high flux of neutrons. So neutrons are being crammed in the nuclei and making them heavier. Some of those neutrons don't decay, actually, some of those nuclei don't decay, and they absorb another neutron, and another one, and another one, and at the same time, some fraction of them are decaying, and so the R and the S process pathways are basically either coming, you know, very high flux of neutrons and building stuff up like this, and, and when you get to the sort of magic neutron number, the um, nucleus becomes stable enough that it starts to change its proton number you know, by decay and continually absorbing neutrons but not moving up further along, right? And uh, just it absorbs a neutron, makes a proton, absorbs a neutron, makes a proton, and stays at 82 neutrons. At some point, you start to then move off that trend again to get to the next magic number, et cetera, et cetera. But, but these are the initial nuclei that are formed. And then these things are all going to decay after they're formed up in this direction towards what's not shown on here, but the stable nuclear, the thing I showed you at the beginning. In the S process path, right, we also make nuclei, but in a relative sense, they're a lot less neutron rich for their proton number, right? So that, the, and the reason for this is that as we're building up those nuclei, we're cramming in neutrons, we're not cramming them in quite as fast. So there's a lot more of this sort of cramming some neutrons, that nucleus decays to something else, absorbs another neutron, decays to something else. So you end up with nuclei that are a lot less um, neutron rich. But what, what we end up doing is building up these processes and then calculating statistically and then observing within STAR the number of stable nuclei that come from each of these processes. And then it gives us an idea of the relative proportions of R or S process that are happening in one place or another. And, you know, in essence, when we try to explain the, all of the abundance of the elements that we have here, we know that it couldn't have been one R process event or one S process event. We had to have both. There had to be multiple of them. And as we'll see later from extinct radionuclides, we know that the last supernova in the vicinity of our um, solar nebula before it condensed and started to burn at the star happened on a very short time scale, a million years, 10 million years, something like that. Perhaps even that supernova caused the collapse of our cloud of gas and dust to then start to form um, you know, a star that was doing its own stuff. But so these two processes basically can be explained um, as such. You know, both of them take a chemical element with some proton number and some atomic mass and add a neutron to it, right? And the difference is, um, you know, whether or not the neutron flux is high or low and therefore how fast the, the process is. And just recognizing that many of the nuclei that are built up by this process are radioactive themselves, right? They're unstable. And, um, we can see some of this kind of things happening, even like in nuclear power plants on Earth, there's a neutron flux that comes out of them. We irradiate the materials. Those materials then become radio, secondary radioactivity that we can watch decay, right? And this is a, that's a very, very small neutron flux compared to what we have in a star. But we have some basic understanding about how this process happens, okay? Um, and so in this case, the neutron flux is pretty much so rapid that it, um, skips over a lot, not all, but a lot of the nuclear decay that's happening as we're building stuff up. So we build up these neutron rich nuclei and then they decay, whereas the S process has a more balanced kind of, um, you know, some decay and some building up at the same time. There's another process called the P process, which is required to explain some chemical elements. This happens much less frequently, but it involves a very, very high of density of protons and cramming protons in the nuclei. Okay, so in the this is a p process nuclei, for instance, the making seventy four selenium from seventy two uh, germanium. You, you can't make it. There's no stable pathway on either of these two things. There's some other even more esoteric processes that happen. 
right? So these are just two primary things that build up the majority of the elements heavier than iron in the parent chart. But it's not to say that there aren't other things going on. It's also important to recognize that there are some nuclei, <clears throat> excuse me, lighter than iron that are also produced in this process. It doesn't only happen above iron. Some of the sort of minor isotopes also form that one. And so this is just kind of a summary or a graphic of that. You got a nucleus, you're cramming in neutrons, you're making something new, and then that nucleus is decaying. And that nucleus is usually decaying by having a neutron do a beta minus decay, which means spinning out an electron, then that neutron turns into a proton. That is a common decay mechanism along the R and the S process. And so really what you're trading off is the rate at which this is happening and the rate at which this is happening, right? And so if this is happening at a greater rate than this is happening, you're following the slow process, right? You're building up along this path. And if the neutron addition is so much more intense, like orders of magnitude more intense than the electron, then you're on the R process. <clears throat> okay, so this is just a depiction of some pathways <clears throat> kind of zoomed in. <clears throat> These are stable elements that we have today in black. And this is a slow process pathway of building up neutrons and then they get to a point where they decay, and then we add more protons, uh, excuse me, more neutrons, they decay to protons. We can build up stepwise through this process, right? And this is this is just like a snippet of that um, uh, chart of the nuclides. And this is where the R process path sits relative to that, okay? And there are slightly different areas of the chart, right? This is maps the neutron number 30 to 43, and this is 48 to 56. So they're adjacent to each other. But you can see that the S process pathway skates out kind of below, and these arrows represent radioactive decay. You know, very, very short-lived nuclei, they're going to decay to one thing, then another thing, then another thing. And this diagonal arrow is the pathway for a beta minus, where you're taking a neutron and making it into a proton. And so, um, you know, I'm just giving you some examples of these things, which can be calculated, you know, as the probability that they're going to happen and the time scale and the density of neutrons are required and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Now, in that process, you build up all the nuclei, and we can explain the difference between odd and even nuclei by what's called the electron capture cross section of nuclei that are even and, and odd. And what we find is that um, odd nuclei, on average, have a higher neutron capture cross-section than even nuclei, which means they're more willing to accept the neutron and turn into something else in the R and the S process than the even ones. The even ones are more reluctant to do it. They still do it. Both of them do it. But the reason we end up with more even nuclei in the chart is because the odd nuclei were a little bit more accepting of neutrons during this building up process. And when they do that, then an odd nucleus turns into an even nucleus when it accepts um, you know, one atomic mass. And so that's really the distinction. Another kind of important thing to think about are these, um, the sort of the, what we call the isobars, which means at a given, atomic mass, you can have different mixtures of protons and neutrons, right? And so when you have um, an even atomic mass and an even number of protons and neutrons, the energy distribution is such that um, you can have two possible mass combinations, right? Even, even in two different scenarios or odd, odd, and the odd odd, even though it makes an even isobar, even mass material, is energetically less favorable than one of these two things, which again ex helps explain the abundance of why. And I showed you that chart at the very beginning. There were so few even mass elements with odd numbers of protons and odd numbers of neutrons. Just much more common. You want to minimize energy. And so it's much more common to make these combinations. Whereas if you have either an even number of protons and an odd number of neutrons, or uh, an even number of neutrons and an odd number of protons, when you combine them together, there isn't that much difference. That's why we get roughly equal proportion of odd nuclei of either flavor. It is still true 
that even nuclei are more stable than odd nuclei, right? But when we make the odds, we get roughly equal proportions of you know all of these combinations. Whereas when we're making the evens, we tend to make things with an even number of protons and even number of neutrons. So it's just you know, why the energy minimizes this way, I don't really know. Something about the symmetry of matter and so forth, but um, that is what happens, okay? So this is kind of a summary of those chain of events. You know, basically, um, initially you have gas uh, of, you know, for hydrogen and subatomic particles, it condenses together. The amount of material that's present determines its mass, its density, its internal temperature, and it starts off these nuclear burning processes. And those processes um, can progress further along the sequence of events that can ultimately build up the whole pair of chart. The more massive a star is, the more massive a star is, the shorter the time scales are. The S process can be happening in these very large um, AGB stars, uh, happening kind of out near the annulus of that and before it novas. The supernova process, the R process, happens very close to the core of a sun where the neutron density is really high. And as it's ejecting that material, as the star is dying, it's ejecting this material out. Okay. And from that, you can explain a lot about the atomic abundances. Most of this I've already talked about, so I'm not going to go through it again. But the relative proportions of the odd and even isotopes, the relative proportion of the um, R and S process nuclei to the uh, nuclear burning nuclei, uh, the relative kind of peaks in abundances related to the magic number, the odd even isotopes, so all that stuff that, that we just talked about is by some combination of phenomena happening, not just in one star, but many stars integrated, averaged over time, making an interstellar cloud of composition that then condenses, and we don't assume it's the same everywhere, right? We know what we got in our star, right? And we know what we got in the stars around us. They all look pretty similar, right? So this idea was pretty homogeneous, if not exactly. But that doesn't mean if you go to the other, other side of our galaxy that you're gonna have the same exact proportion of these things, right? And you can look at differences and understand the relative proportions of those things. And so this is just a plot kind of showing you, you know, all of the stable nuclei again. Right, remember the R and the S process shoot off down below this. And the way that we think, the primary way we think each one of those things is formed. And so most of these things, right, you recognize hydrogen burning, helium burning, um, you know, P process, R process, et cetera, et cetera. There are a couple other things in here that are required to explain some of the chemical elements that we haven't talked about, but it's a pretty systematic system, okay? So there was another topic that even though we only have a few minutes, I kind of wanted to introduce to you, which is how we know the age of our solar system because it relates directly to this. Okay. And this, there's a couple of ways of estimating that. One is to basically just look at all the stars that we can see in the visible sky, right? And know something about their speed from their redshift, the way out, you know, the light coming back to us. And this is these are calculations that were made quite some time ago. So this is from a scientific American article in the 90s. <clears throat> And this estimate has stood, you know, it's a pretty good estimate of something like 13.7 billion years of time to, and, you know, people come up, there's a range in here, but this is kind of the average, but to make this material. And the, the one thing that uh, this distribution of material expanding from a singularity, and the one thing that, that causes some uncertainty is how much dark matter is out there. You know, dark matter is something that we can infer but can't measure directly. But it has gravitational attraction and it might um, affect the relative rate at which expansion is happening and so forth. So this is kind of one of the things of uncertainty. But this is this is a good starting point. We actually think the um, you know it's a little bit older than that, but that's that's a pretty good starting point. The other ways of doing it, there's two relative ways of doing it, but they have to do with chemical um, processes. One of them is to look at the rate of nuclear burning in the most distant star we can see and knowing something about that discussion that we just had saying how far away is that star and how old do we think it is etc cetera, etc cetera. this um again has a lot of uncertainty related to you know being able to translate the distance of that star to a rate of speed because of uh, or a rate of expansion because of uncertainty about dark matter and the third way which i just want to talk about briefly is by radioactive decay. 
right? So if we know that during the R and the S process, we make some thorium and uranium and uranium 235, we know they have radioactive decay, and we know the rate of their decays, which are shown here, and we know what they decay into, we can look at the abundance of those things in different stars, uh, including our own. And we can make some estimate about the age of the, of the um, for instance, our solar system or other stars, right? And there's basically two ways you can make this estimate. Um, one of them is to assume that, for instance, look at our sun. Yeah, and say all the thorium and uranium that was there formed once, one time in the past, and it's been decaying ever since, right? Another way is to take the other extreme, which is to say, no, no, there's been this like statistical population of, of R and S process events and supernovae, and it's made like a soup that has some of each of these isotopes in it, and then our star formed in the decay. And there could be some end member in between, you know, one stellar event and many stellar events. But if you at least go back to the start of our solar system, <clears throat> this is the proportion of each of these isotopes that we think was present. And as I said, you can do decay corrections on these things, and it's described on the next few slides in detail of either a one star before our star formed, and it produced some thorium and uranium, and then it decayed to make this proportion that happened when our star formed 4.6 billion years ago. And you can calculate a time for that. Or you can do the statistical calculation where all oh, there's a bunch of supernovas and you can calculate a time from it. And they give us bookends, right? And so I'm, I'm gonna kind of go through, you can read these calculations, but what they partly depend on is looking, instead of looking on Earth, looking in materials that we think the Earth formed from. And we're gonna talk about these in a lot of detail. There's a kind of meteorite called a C1 chondrite, which is an unmetamorphosed slash, uh, uh, excuse me, sediment, um, plastic sediment rock of the earliest materials that we think existed in our nebular gas. We never collided together and remelted and made all the stuff that we see in the in um, other kinds of meteorites and the planetary bodies, but they have very similar atomic abundances to our sun. And so we can take C1 chondrites that were locked in at 4.6 billion or 4.56 billion years or something in between, wherever the case may be, for that particular one. We can age date it, we can correct back to the isotopes that were present at its time. And then we can calculate how many, uh, what's the proportion of these things relative to those two end members, a single nuclear synthetic event before it formed or a statistical nuclear synthetic event. As I say, I go through these calculations here, but one of them, if you had a single event, it would say that the whole galaxy um, was only 6.7 billion years old, which we know is too young. And if you go the other uh, route, you end up with a number of about 15.1. Basically, 10.5 billion years before C1 chondrites and our solar system formed, we had, we locked in our stuff. That, that was a time scale of the statistical buildup. And when you add that to the zero, it gives us something more like 15.1. And if you look this up, you know, people argue all the time about what the exact number is, um, but something like 15, right? Some people say, oh, it's 14.6. No, it's 15.6. It's because there's vagaries in all of these estimates, right? But this is really what we're doing is looking at the materials we have today, what process must have happened to form them and long, using long lived radioactive nuclei to infer a time scale in between. So I just wanted to, you know, read through these things. This is this is the like latest, greatest estimate. Um, this is a summary of it. This is all in the reading. If you have questions about this, um, next time, because I did go through it quickly, we can talk about it, but it's, um, get, you know, ask or, or send me an email, but it's, um, you know, it's a pretty straightforward set of calculations, to be honest. And I would argue that these radioactivity ones are more robust, there's more measurables that we can, uh, you know, not without uncertainty, but there are more measurables from these methods, and there are other isotopes that you can apply this to. You don't only have to do Thorium and uranium, there are other long lived isotopes that this works for us too. Samarium, for instance, the All right, thank you.